So it is the ninth day of July 2018, allegedly according to that thing we call a calendar, and this is the Ocelli Effect broadcast live from the facilities of Ocelli.com. Do appreciate you for tuning in. It is a moon day or a Monday on that calendar that uh, you might have hanging somewhere or looking at a digital representation of on your computer or device, but you know, it, it, it's going to be an interesting week here on the show. I just want you guys to know that, but none more interesting than tonight because we are going to go into the third part now of the discussion with Jordan Maxwell really uh, completely <laughs> dissecting, or maybe it's a vivisection, you know, because that's the reality here. A dissection is something you do on something that's dead. A vivisection is the same type of operation, but you do it on something that is alive. So I guess the accurate word here would be a vivisection on religion. In general, now we've certainly spent a bit of time talking about the Old Testament. We've talked about the New Testament just a bit. We're certainly not going to just remain in the Christian area of study. And who is better to do that with than Jordan Maxwell? And uh, this is just <laughs> this is just an honor and a privilege for me. I'm so glad. Of course. You can follow up on all of what is being discussed tonight, which will be very little from me, although I am willing to enter your questions, okay, and your comments into the conversation if you go to the live chat room at Ocelli.com, if you give me a message on Skype, if you send me an email at info at Ocelli.com, I will enter your questions into the discussion. <clears throat> Just try to make them reasonable. It's the only request I have. Um, outside of that, uh, you can participate in this as well. But anyway, now I put all of that out there, and you can study all of this much, much further, much deeper by going to, guess where, jordanmaxwellshow.com. Now, you do have to put all of that in because that is the only website that is actually involved with Jordan Maxwell himself, Jordan Maxwell Show. Dot com. Now, that's true, but also there's another website within the website, and it's the Research Society. There's a button there. You go in there, and I'm telling you right now, there is a ton of information, which, well, ton, not really a ton. There's terabytes of information that are either there or being added. <laughs> there is a continuous process going on, and this is the deeper research Jordan is Putting together it with a webmaster, uh, assisting him all the way, but uh, but definitely this is Jordan showing you the reading material. The uh, I just don't even know how to describe the volumes of material that Jordan must have studied over the more than half a century, discussing topics like this one tonight, but many many others. Anyways, all of that out of the way, and now that I've like taken a couple of minutes of everybody's time. To give you that, and I will give you guys that information about the website one more time before this show is over, I promise. But let's get to it. Jordan Maxwell for part three of the discussion on religion. I'm so glad you're with us tonight. How are you? Well, thank you very much for inviting me back. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure doing a show with you because you're so very kind and, and thoughtful, and I appreciate your kindness. And uh because the, the subject matter is very, you know, pretty difficult to talk about, but uh, it's all there. I mean, I, this is why I don't mind talking about it in public, because anybody could, uh, you know, follow up on what I'm doing. I could tell you where to go, and what books, and where to find these information, because the information's always, always been out there. Information about the whole world you live in has really always been out there. If you just know where to look, and and if you even care to look, if you care about the knowledge, if you care about knowing for sure something instead of believing in something, but if you want to know for sure, the knowledge has always been out there. And so you just have to decide if you want to know. And if you really want to know, if you don't want to believe something, but you want to be able to prove it one way or the other, then uh, all you need to do is just go out and, like the scripture says, knock and it will be open, and seek and you will find. Right. Ask now, and it will be given to you. And right. Now, what's, what's great about yeah. this, Jordan, by the way, I just want to 
give you something here really quickly is that we've gotten uh-huh. quite a few thank yous, uh, mm-hmm. actually about the material in part one and part two. And I want to stress to you guys that, uh, this is a continuing series that will go exactly as long as Jordan thinks he needs to go, uh, regarding this particular topic. So we have no idea how many episodes this will take. But, uh, but <laughs> so yeah. far, this is the third one. Uh, and, and this is precisely what I said that we would do. Um, but I did want to recognize the fact that people have thanked us for, uh, pointing out, uh, the, the interesting topic of Dagon, uh, you know, which, uh, is the, the God actually, which is, uh, worshiped by the Catholic Church. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, that may sound shocking to some people, but uh, you take a look at the information, you find out that uh, the, the, the places that Jordan pointed you to on this show are very reliable. Some people thanked me for that. Uh, some people found this kind of upsetting already. But also, uh, I had a mixed reaction from a couple of people who found it upsetting and also thanked you for doing this. Uh, so it, it's kind of interesting, Jordan. It's like, uh, you know, some people are just going to be angry because you are interrupting their belief system. Uh, their, their way of life is somehow structured all the way around this core belief. And I could understand that if they knew what it was they were placing their belief in. But yeah, anyway, you're right. You're right. And, it's, uh, it, it's like sad. I said to you before, uh, one of the other programs, if, if you're going to ship a, a box across the country and you want to secure it, so you go in the garage, you get a rope and tie the box up, and that should be good enough. But if you're going to take that same rope to the edge of a 10-story building and tie it off, and then you're going to hang on it, uh, then you better check the integrity of that rope before you go hanging your life on it. Well, if you're believing something in a church or a religion and you thoroughly believe that's true, you better go back and do some homework and wake up and look up the the symbols and look up the words and the terms and where these ideas have come from. And then you find out, no, they were just man-made ideas thousands of years ago. People are people. They've always been people. So... Men and women are men and women thousands of years ago. They're still men and women today. And so mm. people make up stories that we call it Hollywood and Hollywood writers. They make up a story and, and before you know it, everybody else likes the story and they're telling their people. And before you know it, you know, uh, the story is all over town. And then a, a, a hundred years later, that story pops up again and, it's a big news story, but you know, to the old timers, it's nothing new. They heard the story before. Well, right, and, and, then, and let me know. let me stop you right there for one reason. Yeah. And then this is probably the only question I'm going to ask of you this hour because I want you to run with this, and I know you will. Uh, here, here's the thing to to illustrate your point. There was a movie a long time ago called The Ten Commandments, right? Yeah. And mm-hmm. uh, this starred Charlton Heston, I believe. And yep. uh, you know, it, it was, and I've seen the film. I, I used to own it actually. Uh, I thought that this was a, a representation of what they call an Old Testament story regarding uh, Moses, right? Yep. Moses, mm-hmm. who is a key figure in the Old Testament, who is a key figure in what they call Judaism. Uh, mm-hmm. And and certainly that makes him a, a bedrock figure in Christianity because one appears to be based on the other, you know. <laughs> if, Absolutely. If, if you're just kind of looking at this from the outside or quite honestly it, it, most Christians believe this as well but the thing is that uh, that story is, is being retold uh, once again has been retold there's been television movies of it not quite to the grandiose uh, level of the Ten Commandments but then again there were some newer ones we've even recently had you know Noah and the Flood uh, redone and you know coming out of Hollywood and a whole bunch of yeah. other allegedly biblically based movies it illustrates your point perfectly but yeah. I would like to focus on Moses because I see a similarity with another historical figure that was actually a historical figure and not a biblical figure. And it it leads to a lot of questions about this individual who was supposed to be Moses. Um, yeah. and, and again, one of the keystones to the faith, in my estimation, if you take them at their word, if you take the stories for what they're supposed to be and the, and the teachings, and even if, if this was an allegory, but this was history, and this was, you know, all of those arguments, it's kind of interesting when you take a look at this kind of figure, because 
to me, Moses is uh, a fascinating character. But oh, yeah. mm -hmm. what is he really? Because, see, he almost parallels perfectly with <laughs> an Egyptian pharaoh. And the story is kind of <laughs> odd. <laughs> You know, and of course, uh, a, a friend of mine once told me about this, and I thought he was kind of out of his mind until I started looking at it. Uh, mm -hmm. And he said, "You know, you really need to go back and study Akhenaten." And I said, "Really? Well, I re recall the name. I'm sure. You know, I've gone through lots of different historical uh, figures and uh, 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 time periods in history. I've studied a lot of Roman history. I've studied a lot of American history. I've studied and." I got to say that, you know, I said, well, come on, man, really? And, and then I decided to take a look just to see how, you know, is this, is this, you know, something he ate talking or is this real? Uh, <laughs> and when I took a look at it, you know, lo and behold, um, my friend had a point. But anyway, I'll leave it to you to uh, to kind of deal with the figure we call Moses. Yep. Well, <clears throat> first of all. Moses is not a Hebrew word or name. It's an Egyptian term. It's an Egyptian word. It has nothing to do with Hebrews at all. And second of all, I've only been looking at this subject of theology and religions and where they came from and tracing the uh, etymology of the words and terms and symbols and comparative religions, etc., etc., for almost... Well, it's 59 years now. I started in 1959, and it happens to be 59 years ago. And uh, so I've been looking at this for almost 60 years now, and, and I've heard all the stories. I've, I have talked with rabbis galore. I've talked with Jesuit priests and theologians and researchers and authors and lecturers and teachers around the world. And I've heard all the stories. I've traveled around the world. I've been to Egypt three times. I was blessed in the King's Pyramid. I, I've, I've just been fascinated with religion and God and the spirit world. And where do we come from? How do we get here? And when we leave, where are we going? And so it's always been a big thing to me to learn about God. <clears throat> And so, first off, uh, you know, we could start anywhere. Why are there three major religions now in our world? Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Why are there three? Uh, well, why then do you have each one of those religions have a triune God? And, and, and all three of those religions are traced back to the Hindus, and they have a triune they have a triune God. Hinduism is the mother of all three of our major religions today. Christianity comes directly out of the Brahmin Hindu religion. Uh, it, Judaism is purely Brahmin Hindu religion, retold uh, a, a new, so that we think it's all Jewish. No, it's it's actually Hindu and. Most of the professors and, and the, uh, the rabbis and the great teachers throughout the ages have always known this. I mean, there's so many books out there talking about the actual beginnings of the three major religions today is Hinduism. But, you know, we, it doesn't seem to be very important to most people because it really doesn't have – that kind of information is not really important because – it doesn't have anything to do with the important things of today, like football and Paris Hilton and the basketball game and all that nonsense that children play. But the adults who know what's going on in this world, they just sit quietly and let the uh, human race do what it does best. Go play a game. Go bounce a ball and have a beer and entertain yourself and the real knowledge of the universe and how this world really works is for a small handful of people who are at the top of our world. Like uh, George Carlin says, it's a big club and you ain't in it. But once, you, once you begin to research and study the dark side of your life, the dark side of life in general, where things really come from, and what banks really are, and why do you have police, and where did our government come from? 
and who really owns the land you live on and what and who designed the earth and are we a creature of, of creation or we just pop out of the mud once you begin to look at the real questions about life and begin to see that we've known for a long time the human race has known for a long time some of the real legitimate answers but it's not felt that it's important for the common people to bother themselves with the real tragic answers to human uh, to human life, and so that's why you know it's it, this kind of knowledge is on a need to know basis, and the people who run your planet and run this country they figure you don't need to know, you just go in and go do your job and do your work and. Hopefully you can pay your rent and, and, and fill your belly and keep yourself full of food and, and, and alcohol and entertainment. And one day you'll die and thank God you're gone and the whole world will follow you. And so today we have seven and a half billion people. And um, in my humble opinion, most of the people on the earth are like old Christmas tree lights. Half of them don't work, and the rest are not that bright. And the reason why is because they don't want to know. They're not really interested to know. <clears throat> but I, as a kid, always realized that when I was talking to adults, it's like a little kid, 10, 11 years old, I was asking adults uh, questions that I really thought that they would know the answer to and would help me. And it became uh, 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 obvious to me as a kid that the adults do not know what they're talking about. All the adults had different ideas, different ex explanations. None of them appealed to my sense of logic, my sense of reason. Uh, I would listen to you know, the adults, and they would explain things to me that I asked them to, and it made no sense to me. And then I think it's appropriate that I could throw this in, an experience that I had uh, where I was, a, I was born and raised a Catholic in a Catholic family, and I was in Catholic school, and uh, we were told at eight, nine, ten years old children, we were told that uh, there's going to be a special, uh, a special church service just for us children. And we were all going to be there. We were told by the nuns that this special service was called uh, confirmation, where we were going to be confirmed Catholics at 10 years old. And so we were supposed to be in church the next night, and the, the, the nuns told us. Now, after the service is over and confirmation service is over, the bishop is going to be here, of course, <clears throat> and everybody in town will know the bishop is coming, and he's going to be here. So everybody, all the Catholics in town are going to be here. It's going to be a very special night. And so she told us as children, she said, now tomorrow night after the service, the bishop might possibly, maybe not, but he might possibly ask you if there are any questions you have about the church and about your beliefs, and he'll try and answer them for you. <clears throat> and then she went on to say, now, if he does that, remember, you do not have any questions. You keep your mouth shut. You have no questions. And so already I pretty well, I've got uh, uh, their number. I already know what the church is about now. You, know, you don't have any questions, so just shut up. And so the next night after the service was over, if, uh, it, it, it turns out that the bishop did just that. And he said, if you children have any questions, I, I'll try and answer them for you now that you're confirmed Catholic. And so I stood up. I wanted everybody in the, the church, and the place was crowded. And I stood up to make sure everybody knew it was me. And I said, Bishop, I have a question. And I said, my father works with torches, like a welder, and he's let me hold them and, and play with them a bit. So I know what a torch is like. And I said, if there was an angel standing next to me, could I hit the angel with a torch? Could I burn him with a torch? And would it hurt him? And he said, no. And I said, why not? And he said, well, but first of all, angels are spirits. And you can't see a spirit, much less burn one, because there's nothing to burn. 
And I said, I don't understand. And he said, well, fire, he said something to, to the effect that fire is a natural phenomenon. It's, you need paper or wood or, or, or plastic or something to burn. It's a natural thing. And I said, well, can I burn an angel? He said, no. I said, why not? He said, because angels are spirits, and you can't burn a spirit. And so I said, well, then why am I so concerned about going to hell where my spirit will burn forever if you can't burn the spirit? And uh, most of the people in the church looked at each other like a deer in the headlights. It never occurred to them to ask a silly, nonsensical, ten-year-old child question. And there it was. You can't burn a spirit. So there is no hell where your spirit's going to burn because you can't even see a spirit, much less burn one. And so uh, after that, I began to begin to see that there's so many things that I have been taught in religion that just don't make any sense to me. And I'm trying to relate to all of these uh, different religious beliefs in the Catholic Church and realizing that the adults around me, they haven't got even a, a, a... a modicum of knowledge. I'm looking at all of this stuff and examining it, but the adults, they just go to church. They don't know what's going on. They go home and they have no idea in the world where they're going to go when they die. They have no idea what the word God means because it's just dog spelled backwards. And so the whole subject of religion was something that was very interesting to me because I'm fascinated with human life and where we've come from, and what this universe is really all about. And so I began asking questions, and today I'm still asking questions, but I've got a few answers that, excuse me, that I think possibly, uh, you know, some in the audience will like to know for a change, something that's real. So there's a very big difference between a belief system, something you believe in, or something you know for sure. And so the kind of government we have in the world today, and especially us in America, <clears throat> the government we have in America today does not care about what you believe. You can believe anything you want. And they don't believe. They don't care to believe anything about you. The government doesn't. They want to know, not believe. So they have organizations that pay pay large sums of money to make sure they know exactly what you eat and where you go. It's called CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. They don't care about what they believe you're doing. They want to know. And so that's the way I have always felt about my life. I don't care to believe anything. I want to know. But religion is useful as a control mechanism. And part of the way that that control mechanism functions, Jordan, is by telling these stories repetitively. And these stories don't have to actually, I mean, they they can appear to have a meaning, but they don't have to have any truth in them. They may contain some truth, but they really all they need is to have a good distraction. And that's why they don't bother to tax churches. (laughs) No, I know, I know. Because they're, 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 you know, they're doing part of the job that needs to be done, which is to keep people locked into a narrative, right? And, and that's, that's why the thing about Moses is so interesting to me. Because again, I mean, you, you can ask any child who's been to Sunday school, they'll tell you the story of Moses. One way or another. I mean, they might not know the whole thing, but uh, they might have seen a movie. They might have seen a cartoon because there's been various right. cartoons made of it. I mean, all over and over and over again, this interesting narrative, which, you know, the basis, uh, we, we, we know the basis. You know, he, he's in yeah, a basket, course. right? Yeah. And then he's picked up by uh, Egyptian royalty and he's raised. And then this leads to the exodus of the oh. Jews, according to the story. <clears throat> Yeah, and, uh, and then when you find out that, uh, as I have, and you would too, if you do the kind of reading I do, uh, go to the reference works, the encyclopedias and, and the Encyclopedia Britannica and Americana and 
the Jewish Encyclopedia. It's called Encyclopedia Judica, and especially the Catholic Encyclopedia. Go to the big seminar, uh, 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 what am I trying to say, uh, the big libraries, <clears throat> and look up the religious uh, reference works. Look up the, the Bible dictionaries. Uh, religious uh, dictionaries and etymology of words, and just sp- spend uh, spend a year just reading every day, and and all the different re- research uh, volumes about religions and words and terms and where they came from, it, and the derivation of religions in the earth, and <clears throat> you will begin to see that there's a whole world of intellectual knowledge and wisdom that the world has known but they're not sharing with you that the uh, that the rabbis know about the Jewish religion that the most Jews don't and they're not even they're, and that most Jews don't care they're all like everybody else they're out making a living and doing what they do with their families and working and building their life with their families and they don't care about the rest of the you know about what the rabbis really know and some of them know that the rabbis know something, but they're not going to they're not going to get into it right now. So, and it's the same thing with the church, with the uh, Christian church. We have people calling themselves Christians that have no idea where the word came from, and they they have a they have a man they call Jesus the Christ or Jesus Christ. They have no idea in the world what the word Christ actually means and where it came from. And that it's a it's a it's a word in Greek for oil. So Christ is Christos, Christos is oil, and Pillsbury's got a cooking oil called Crisco. No, it's Crisco is Christo, and Christo in Latin is Christ. So Jesus the Christ is Jesus the Crisco or Christo, or the Christ the oil. So therefore, Jesus the oil or Jesus Christ. How many people know that? And better still, how many people care? They don't even care where the word Christ comes from. All they know is that Jesus the Christ means anointed. And then when you say, wow, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus the Christ, Christ means anointed? No, you're misunderstanding the word. Go back to encyclopedia and do something you've never done before. Look at it and read it and understand where the word Christ comes from. And therefore you will see it's Jesus the oil. And the oil was always used as a, as a symbol for, uh, anointing. When a king or queen, today in Europe, if a queen or king is crowned, we refer to them as being anointed by God. And so they have a divine right to rule by divine right. What are you talking about divine right? Well, because God has ordained them to be the king or queen. What God? It's G-O-D, as dog spelled backwards. What God are you talking about? Because, I don't know if you read it or not, but in the Bible it says the God of this world is the devil. Period. End of sentence. So if your God has anointed you king, maybe it's the devil that's anointed you king. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. It says the God of this world is the devil. What is the devil? Well, it's the word evil. E-V-I-L with a D in front of it. It becomes devil. And God is simply the word good with an O out of it. So God is good and devil is evil. Now you're looking at words and terms and where they come from and so the bottom line is that religion is a very interesting and very uh, misunderstood uh, discipline in the world of mankind. There's only a handful of people who know what I'm talking about. If they are teachers of theology, if they are professors in universities who happen by chance to be hearing me, I don't have to explain it to them. They already know what I'm talking about. But it's the people, the regular, ordinary people that I want to help and do I want to demystify the belief system and show you where these things actually come from. Because I grew up in a household that was, was very devoted to God and to the church, etc., but I never understood any of it. It didn't make any sense to me. 
Now it does. Now it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but it took me 58 years or 59 years to, to come to the conclusion. And so what I try and do is I always try and say that I am not the world's foremost authority on anything. I'm not an authority on anything. I'm too smart to know how much I don't know. So I'm just interested to uh, share with my fellow man the things which I have learned. Uh, and over the years, I have come to be in the company of and had the success of being in the company of important people around the world. People that I have as personal friends of mine, you have no idea in the world that I know them. I mean, very powerful people that you would recognize their name and their position in this world. But I talk with them privately, behind the scenes. And so after the years of being able to do this and confide with these people, and they confide with me uh, what they're really doing and what the story of government really is and where the banks actually come from, and what the insurance companies really are, according to the 14th Amendment, when you get into all the dark uh, manifestations and machinations of commerce, and then you go to the uh, encyclopedias, or the better still, law dictionaries, and look up the word commerce. You know, we talk about commerce as business. No, go back to a law dictionary and look up the word commerce. Commerce, it will tell you in a law dictionary, is sex, period. It's a business. Happily, it's none of my business, but uh, that's your business. And sex in my life is my business, not your business. But it is a business. And then look up the word Congress, because we like to talk about the Congress. The United States Congress did this, and the Congress is doing that. Look up the word Congress. It's sex. In Latin, the word Congress is sex. You co and then you finish by Congress. Congress is sexual play. So, therefore, commerce and Congress are sex. So, you know, I, I, you know that and two bucks will get you a cup of coffee. But it, at least it begins to explain to you the words you use every day, the ideas and the concepts you think you understand, now you begin to see as nothing but sex and drugs, rock and roll, and political power. And the people have no idea where all this sex and money and all this machinations over the human race, where it all actually, in fact, came from. And so, therefore, in the ancient and prehistoric world, the kings were always representing God. So the king was not only uh, in charge of the government, of the people. He didn't only represent the power of the people and the government, but he represented God because he had a divine right of king. Well, what are you talking about a divine right? Well, it just basically means God has given you that power to be king. Well, how do you understand that correctly where you understand the divine right of kings because kings and queens in Europe all over Europe and all around the world are always appointed by the Pope of Rome all roads lead to Rome so the papacy has for 1600 years uh, uh, dominated Europe all over Europe, the, pope, the papacy and the pope has dominated the political, spiritual, and, and, and the northern, normal life of every day in Europe is dominated by the papacy. And since the Holy Father represents God, then he is the God Father. Get it? This is why La, La Cosa Nostra and the Mafia, La Cosa Nostra and the secret societies and criminal organizations are all home office out of Italy, Sicilians, Corsica. The, uh, you know, it's, it's an incredible, and of course, France is very Catholic. And you get the French connection with, uh, with the drug trafficking, child trafficking, dope and, and wars and violence and underworld organizations. All of this is Vatican domination of the world, P. 
period. If you want to get a, a, an idea about what I'm talking about, go back and watch <clears throat> the movie Godfather 3, the third in the series. The whole, the whole movie of the Godfather and the Mafia is inside the Vatican, sitting with the Holy Father and doing business between the Vatican and the mob. <clears throat> that's a movie that's based on real life experience. So I'm just saying that the world is not what you think it is. Nothing is what you think it is. And most people do not have the time or the inclination to sit and read and study for days on end, over and over, as I have for many years. I lived in university libraries, theological libraries, looking up the words, the terms, the symbols, and then eventually, as I said to you before, it all begins to make sense eventually. After you've looked at all of it and heard it all and seen it all and, 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 and investigated it all with the best minds in the world, the best writers and researchers and leading theoreticians, it all then one day begins to make sense. The whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. This mm. is what the scripture says. The whole world has been lied to, deceived, and continues to crawl on its knees. Humanity crawls on its knees to its masters. We love to watch uh, our masters. We, we, uh, we, we fall over ourselves uh, to see the Holy Father. Yeah, I'd like to see him when he's meeting with the mob and the Lacusa Nostra. That's what I'd like to see. And so uh, I like to see the priests, what they're really doing with the houses of prostitution that the Vatican runs in, 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 in Rome. Most people don't know that. Most people have no idea that the whole idea and history of a nun, the, the women in the church that are devoted to Christ, the history books, and especially the Catholic Encyclopedia, says the original nuns were actually prostitutes that the, that the cardinals kept uh, and and they they were kept women. They were kept prostitutes, and so the cardinals would tell these the young women that they that they had uh, as prostitutes that uh, you know when you're dealing with me, you're dealing with God. So you are serving God, and that's me. And so that's where we get the word nuns today. The nuns were prostitutes. Go back and read the Catholic Encyclopedia. And look up the word nun and find out what it means. It's a fish in Hebrew. And so you look at the words and the terms and the symbols and the, and, and the institutions that we have today. And by God, what a story people don't know. I've been looking at this stuff for so many years and I'm just amazed how obvious it is once you see it. Once you understand the words and the terms and know what the Vatican really is, and know who founded it, and what the, what the main worship in the Catholic Church is, is the main worship of an ancient god called Dagon, which we, so you talked about, D-A-G-O-N. Go back and look it up in the dictionary. It will tell you the Catholic Church worships the god Dagon, D-A-G-O-N. Go do some homework. Wake up. And that's why today all over the world you have religious people, both Catholics <clears throat> and Christians, Jews, Muslims, everybody's praying to God for, for their, their, their country, for their safety, uh, for peace and security. Everyone's praying to God. <clears throat> and the bottom line is there is no peace or security. The bottom line, there is nothing but rape criminality, corruption, druggery, drugs, alcoholism, wars, violence, obscenity, and corruption through and through and all of man's institutions. Well, the other, thing, the, the other thing here is the reason why it seems like uh, everything is a bit confusing uh, about this, Jordan, is because of the language we're speaking. 
Um, yep. and, and I want to enter a couple of things from the chat room really quickly here into the conversation. First of all, they note that, uh, the age of consent in the, in, in, Va- in the Vatican, which the Vatican is a separate nation state from Italy. It is not part of Italy. Uh, want people to know that. Uh, it is its it own is. nation. Uh, but anyway, the age of consent there is apparently, uh, 12 according to the chatter, and I think that's true. I do remember reading that, but something more interesting here, uh, when you were talking about the devil and how, you know, devil is evil, uh, interesting thought here is that uh, devil is lived, spelled backwards, right? So uh, if one imagines uh, that <laughs> lived means the past tense of being alive, well, yep. now if alive, a, by the way, usually means without, uh, atypical means not typical. You know, anarchy is uh, the state of not having a leadership. Okay, so here we go. The A. So you take A live. It seems to me as though life represents that which is not evil. Meanwhile, your devil represents that which is death. Uh, it's kind of an interesting little thing, and there's lots of puzzles like this. Where if you flip a word around, or you take a look at its uh, etymology, or you understand its uh, root, um, here we are. We have the designer language, as you've described it, uh, being constructed so that there is a continuous cycle where people um, get confused, let's be honest. Because uh, one thing sounds like something else, and... It's not. It actually means the opposite of what it says. I mean, I often say that things are mislabeled, but uh, truth, truth again, uh, as yeah. you said, uh, uh, you know, here, here we go. Sometimes you have to just take a look at what what it is they're calling something to understand what it is, where that word came from. Like you said, with the nuns and all this other stuff, it's just it's amazing to yeah. uh, to think about the fact that a language had to be constructed in order to. And, and meanwhile, th- this is the most prevalent language, you know, for people that are really in communication with the rest of the planet is this designer language. Um, Now, in Italian, here's the funny thing. In Italian, things are a little clearer. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, But when you take a look at these things in English, it's it's pretty interesting because the words turn on themselves. I don't think there's another language quite like English. Which, uh, no, no, English is a designed language. It was designed to give the speaker of English a mindset, a particular uh, understanding of the world and how life works and what life is and uh, what truth is. And so the, the English language was purposely designed to give the English-speaking peoples of the world uh, a hard, hard-nosed, interpretation of the esoteric world and boy you get into that and start looking at the way words are used why we have banks when you put your money in a bank and where where do you find a bank well a bank is a river bank it's on both sides of a river it's called a river bank and what does a river bank do it directs the flow of the currency because your money is water and so when you begin to see, you know, in, in Egypt and even today, if you go into the Middle East and Egypt, which I've done three times, I've spoken in Egypt three different occasions. And there, if you walk down the street in town, you will see all of these people sitting on pillows and they've got a, they got a little long bench, a little wooden bench. And then they're, whatever they're selling is on the bench. And so when you want to buy something from them, you reach down, pick up what you want, and then you put the money down on that little wooden bench that the product was sitting on. Now you pay them, so you put the money on that bench. Well, a bench in Latin is spelled B-A-N-K, bank. This is why if you don't show up in a court, you're supposed to be in court and you don't show up, the judge can order a bench warrant meaning the court don't care about you. The bank was expecting to get money from you. You were going to pay, and so, but you're not there to pay. So the bank wants you, not the government. The bank wants you. So he, uh, they issue a, a bench warrant. 
Why? Because that's what a bench is in, in, in the ancient world. That's what people did business on the bench. And so once you see how the, 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 the world works, law works, how the governments work, what the words mean, why do you have a police department? Where did that word come from and who are they? Uh, you know, and banks and police and, uh, and religions and military industrial complex. Where does all this stuff come from? And who are these people? And how is it that they are able to connect themselves behind the scenes and work together? Uh, but we don't know anything about that because we're too busy watching Beavis and Butthead and television shows. And there's nothing to us but the people who run this planet, the fascist, bloodletting murderers who are not of this world. They're mentally disordered people who think that they have the uh, will of God has given them their their kingly power to become king. The Prince Charles and the prince and Princess and all of these people and royalty that actually believe that they have a right to drive around in gold chariots and flip their cigarette butts on you, and you are nothing more than a commoner, so you're a common person. You're not like them. They're uncommon. They are princes and kings. They're not common. You are common. And so then you begin to see why America was founded and, and how we were founded. And that uh, what a hell of a story about the history of America, history of the ancient Roman Empire, and how today the Washington, D.C. is nothing more today. You might as well know it now and get it over with. Washington, D.C. is a Catholic Jesuit institution. It's set up by the Vatican. It's set up and run by the Vatican. It's, you know, and that's why I say CIA is a Catholic intelligence agency. Because the Knights of Malta, the Masonic Order of Knights of Malta and the Knights of St. John, who we call the, the Masonic Orders in the Vatican, they are the people who set up your colleges, your universities, your schools. They have all set up, uh, also set up your government and Washington, D.C., and, uh, and the whole area, that 10 miles square we call the Federal Enclave, or Washington, D.C., was originally, if you go back to a history book and look up, you will find that uh, that 10 miles square we today refer to as Washington, D.C., was called Rome, R-O-M-E, Rome. And that the Caesars, according to the history books of ancient Roman Empire, they would go, a quote, up on the hill, end quote. Caesar ruled from a capitalist hill. The hill that Caesar ruled Rome from was called Capitoline Hill. And so today it's still a hill in Washington called Capitol Hill. And the, and the encyclopedias will tell you Caesar each morning, quote, would go up on the hill, end quote. Well, that's what we say. Well, the president today up on the hill, they said this and this and up on the hill. That's Roman. That's Vatican. That's Catholic, Jesuit, Roman, Catholic, period. That's what you're living under is a Roman, Catholic, Jesuit institution that has overthrown the United States of America as a republic and now is in control of your life, your family, your home, and your country. And this is why today, how did Caesar rule over the Roman Empire when he was up on the hill, end quote? Well, he ruled over the Senate. Well, isn't that what we have? The Caesar goes up on the hill to officiate over the Senate, the United States Senate, and then you find out the symbols of the Senate are Roman fascist symbols, fasces, bloodletting, murderous symbols of the ancient Roman Empire's domination of the peoples of the world, we need to wake up and understand that our country is finished, it's washed up, it's through. And the people are on their knees because they are, like the Bible says, my people are dying from a lack of knowledge. And so that's why the American people, along with everybody else, but especially the Americans, have no ability to change anything. 
They cannot change. They can cry about all the problems, but they can't do anything. Why? They have no power. Why? Because knowledge is power. And unless you understand what's really going on and know the history that the Jewish rabbis know, but they're not telling you, that the Jesuit scholars and theologians in Washington, D.C. and in Rome know, but they're not telling you the history. Once you begin to see what has happened to America, and you are to blame because knowledge is power, and you have no knowledge. That's why you can't do anything. And people that try and awaken you and try to teach you, they are usually... Uh, cast aside and thought to be fools. All this silly nonsense about conspiracy theories. That's all the world has ever been, is conspiracies between governments, between the organized crime, criminals conspiring behind your back, politicians conspiring behind your back. So I'm just saying I've tried to do the best I could to educate my fellow men, and I have paid one hell of a terrible price for doing that. I've lost everything in my life is gone and lost because I try and tell people the truth. And like the movie said, when when uh, Mike Nicholson says, what are you trying to do? What do you want from me, kid? And, uh, And the kid says, I want the truth. He said, you can't handle the truth. Why do you think they put that in movies? Because that's exactly right. You can't handle the truth. People don't want the truth. They want what they want. And what they want is they want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear what they don't want to hear. And that's why the preachers and all the mentally disordered, mentally unstable goofballs, criminals are telling the people on television with TV evangelists, all kinds of nonsensical, silly stories. Uh, and so you send them money. So they're buying their jets and their $100,000 mobile homes for their dogs so their dogs can have an air-conditioned home to live in. And people love it. They don't care. They want the, they want to hear all the stories. And so the criminals, we call them uh, TV preachers and TV uh, clergy, they are just lying to you through through their teeth. And boy, when you finally figure out what the religion that they are promoting, what that religion really is, and what it really came from, it's going to shock you when you find out what the real religion are really all about. And that's why we have three main religions, because each one of those religions... Uh, are divided into three. Their gods are always three gods. Hindu was Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Egyptian was Osiris, Isis, Horus. Uh, Christianity is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And uh, the, the very word church comes from the word for a, for a Greek goddess. The word church comes from a Greek goddess named Circe, C-I-R-C-E. And Circe was, uh, was a mother Circe who could uh, 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 hypnotize people and bring them into her house and eat them. She would bring people into her house, lock the door, take their minds away from them, and then she would feed off of them, Circe. So that's why today we get the word circle and uh, circus. That's why in a, in a circus you have a three-ring circus, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Brahma, Vishnu, Siva, Osiris, Isis, Horus. Jewish, yeah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Right. Wake up! It's just a religion. It's a story. Well, with the and last the, with the last five minutes of this hour, Jordan, because we're we're, we're covering some of the things that we've already covered here. Okay, I, yeah. I want to ask you a question, which I have posed to very few people because I don't think anybody takes the time to think about this. You could understand the criminals who are opportunists, like the televangelists who are enriching themselves. You can understand some of the other criminals who are, you know, basically using other people's vices one way or another, whether they're dealing drugs or they're dealing some other form of poison yep. or death, because they justify it by their gains. But 
there's another level to this. The opportunist criminal, you can almost understand because they've become so disaffected. They become, you know, nearly sociopathic. So they don't care what it is they do to other people. But it's interesting to me because nobody can really explain to me the mindset that goes above that. See, I can understand and, and a little bit of my, a little bit of my personal background gives me the ability to understand this. I'm an empathetic person, but I grew up around criminals. <laughs> I grew up, uh, there was criminals everywhere. That's what I learned from, right? Uh, and, and I, I chose to go in the opposite direction. <laughs> okay. Otherwise I would be one of those criminals, but, and, and, and not saying that I did that my whole life. When I was younger, listen, I made mistakes. I did things I shouldn't have done because I thought it was justifiable. But see, I had this problem and it's called a conscience. Yep. Okay. Me too. Me so too. here's the thing. There's another level above that. Of course there is. Of and course there is. The real puppet masters. I've often tried to reason and figure out what the motivation would be. To literally destroy your own kind, which is what they're doing. Of course. But of course. Why would you destroy all of your own kind? You see, like in other words, I can't wrap my mind around that. I can wrap my mind around the criminal who sells drugs, even though he knows he's killing people. I can wrap my mind around the guy who figures he's picked up, you know, women which are useless in society in one way or another, and he's decided to traffic them. He's decided to pimp them. I can wrap my mind around a justification. I understand. But I can't. And I'm not saying that I agree. I'm not saying that this is good. I'm not saying that I'm on the side of the criminals. I'm just saying that I can feel the understanding of where they could come. I to, understand to that. But when you take a look at the overall puppet masters, the people that are really engineering this, yeah. this is well, a the level of evil. Who are really, yeah. First of all, you need to know that there's a maxim in Roman law. According to the ancient Roman law, there was an idea expressed in the encyclopedias look up roman law and you'll see one of the points of roman law was said quote for he who would be deceived let him unquote end quote so if you want to be deceived if you're ignorant and ill-informed and you want somebody to tell you some wonderful stories about how the lord loves you and you're going to go to heaven and you're going to see your family when you die and and it's going to be wonderful in heaven. So if you want to be deceived, let him. Because the Romans were very crude. And even today, one of our uh, chief uh, uh, law uh, people in the department of, uh, of uh, the, the law, what am I trying to say? One of our chief judges department in the Justice? country oh. said, he said, the law is very cruel and crude. Why? Because that's what, that's what, Nature is. Nature is a very crude and uh, uh, instrument. So, you know, watch the animals that kill each other in the Serengeti Plains of Africa. Watch the lions jump on the little, small little animals that are just born and eat them up. So the, the law says we're just like the nature of the world. The vicious lions and the vicious uh, animals, predators, will serve themselves by eating up the innocent and the children and the ill-informed and the unread. So for he who would be deceived, let him. So that's why I understand what's going on. Mm. It's something very big. Well, we you can know, talk I, about that later. Absolutely. Look, as we come to a break, I mean, look, I'm aware. I mean, I've read in in Latin. I've read, which is different than reading it in English, by the way. Uh, you know, many of the uh, Roman concepts that mm. survive today, as, as the phrase "buyer beware." But yes. uh, but the truth is that uh, the, these Roman concepts were, you know, if, if people want lies, then sell them lies. If people want uh, you know, if people want uh, pain, give them the pain. Yeah. Uh, th th this is literally the mindset, but it's it, it's unrelatable to me. It's inhuman to me. Like I said, I can understand the idea of of, of wishing to profit and prosper from being. <sighs> on one side of an equation or another because you're kind of a damaged person and you came from a place where this level of morality is 
a gray area or a non-existent thing because it's just gone. You know, you, you've never had this lesson that there's an importance to a human life. Yeah. I, 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 I can understand somebody who died. Like, in other words, I can understand somebody who murders. Uh, yep. on some I level too. rage you know you, you get enraged somebody injures you enough you 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 have an angry reaction because you're a human being and you can be a passionate person and you could you know uh, have a uh, a loss of your ability to oh, control of yourself i mean lots of, of different things i can understand but the level of evil that it takes to day to day knowingly engineer the the mass genocide yep. that these people are engineering to literally make people, as you said, you know, my people are dying for a lack of knowledge, to literally let them suffocate because you have some knowledge, you don't release it, you don't allow people to know it, you engineer things so that they cannot have it, you engineer things so they can't have a lot of things that are healthy and decent, and you make sure that that's a scarcity. That's and right. literally, that is the thing you traffic in, is the scarcity of knowledge, resource, decency. If they could figure out a way to take away the air from people, of course, they would of do course. it. They would do it. And see, I understand the whole picture, and I can explain to you uh, the, the, the bottom line, the bedrock bottom line on this question you, you are posing. But it would take a whole program just to set up what I would say so you would understand it. I'd have to go back to uh, the scriptures and go back to uh, the history of the human race and and explain to you who we really are as humans. Where did we come from? And why we call a hue man. Mm-hmm. We have the Neanderthal man, the crea- uh, Cro-Magnon man, but then we have some called a hue, H-U, hue man. And what is a hue man? And so, uh, you know, we could talk about all of this and why it is that the people who run this world are so demonic and depraved as to purposely turn on the human family and kill it. That's what they're doing with us. They are having us do it for ourselves, and they are helping us by spraying us with pollutants and poisons in the air and poisoning our food, poisoning our water, or poisoning the earth. Why? Because they want you dead. They're tired of seeing the human race. They want you dead. Then they can take over the planet and create a whole new kind of life form on the earth. Mm. The new man. That's why you have, you know, that's a whole story, and I could go into that and explain it to you. Well, perhaps and it's all we'll... right there. It's all right there, and you would understand it if I showed it to you and, and took you through it for an hour and just walked through the scriptures and show you exactly what's going on and why and how. Well, so I, we I can... think we have a future episode in mind right there because yeah. Yeah. that that is necessary, I think, to understanding this. But we're going to take a break now uh, and and get deeper into the subject uh, that we're covering tonight. Of course, this is the third part of this very special discussion with Jordan Maxwell. Uh, I have spoken up a bit more in this hour than I wanted to, honestly, uh, but but it's so necessary. Uh, I, I am compelled to to enter a couple of these things in and also uh we'll get to the questions uh that that people have been sending in and a few uh comments and things like that uh as we go further and uh at some point i, I would like to try and uh deconstruct that story about moses again you know because we've already touched upon the christ figure a bit we've talked about uh you know, uh, uh, yeah, Abraham see, a bit. we could do that we can do that well uh it's just that the the moses part of this series will have to go to the next two hour program too because I've got so much on Moses that nobody has ever heard I've got so much and so I, we can get into it a little bit in the next hour but that will just open up a can of worms and we'll have to continue with Moses the next week well we'll, uh, we'll keep opening up these cans of worms here on the Ocelli Effect with Jordan yep. Maxwell and again 
jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website for Jordan Maxwell who begins now here at Ocelli.com. Of course, we appreciate you for tuning in during this very special set of Mondays that we're going to be doing with Jordan Maxwell. Not sure how many uh, it's going to take, but he is uh, basically unpacking religion in general. But uh, we have spent a lot of time on the Old Testament, the New Testament, what the modern implication implications are, excuse me, as I trip over my tongue, um, and uh, various other topics that link to the uh, the control grid that religion is certainly a part of. And uh, I just want to remind you one more time that you go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. That is Jordan's website. You may find other things on the Internet that say Jordan Maxwell, but that is the only website that is actually Jordan Maxwell's. Jordan Maxwell Show dot com and the research society over there. We'll talk about that a little more uh, as we get further into this hour. But we actually went to break a little bit late, and uh, I want to begin uh, talking about uh, the character of Moses in this hour. I'll also try and get your questions and comments in. I've uh, let Jordan know about a few of them during the break, but uh, certainly we will get into those uh, if time permits tonight and if not we do have next week and i'm sure that the moses topic is actually <laughs> going to take us probably all through next week uh if not part of it anyway uh as we uh, as we continue this series so jordan um where shall we go with this pivotal figure i mean uh should we just begin with the mainstream story i mean do, do, do people really need to know it i think anybody who's interested in this topic is huh. aware of the story as you know again preserved in things like the ten commandments movie the various you know uh, specials that have been on television the cartoons the books uh it, the old testament itself uh yeah. if you've ever been to church moses does get discussed at various times and well you know and 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 meanwhile uh if Ju- when it comes to judaism the temples, the synagogues, right? Uh, I'm very sure that the story of Moses is told in the synagogues. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, especially at a particular time yeah. of year when they talk about the Jews leaving Egypt. That's but, right. But, uh, hmm, it's kind of well, weird. <laughs> yeah, but the real story the Jews have not heard. The real story the Jews have not heard. It's been there. It's right there in the encyclopedias and reference works and the Encyclopedia Judica and Jewish reference works and all the Jewish uh, research journals, etc. Uh, and listen to the rabbis, the research rabbis that are doing magnificent work on digging up where all the Jewish stories really came from and what they're really talking about. Let me give you an example. One thing, and all of the magical things that Moses was said to have done, all his magic tricks and whatever. Uh, well, the same idea is attributed to Jesus. He was able to do wonderful, magical things. Uh, but go on, the re- go on the website, I mean, go on the web to, uh, uh, to image. Click on image first. And then you will get only pictures, just images. There's a lot on the web on this subject I'm going to tell you about. But just go on image and type in the word uh, Moses, Jesus, and magic wands. And you will see that all over Europe, in churches and, and synagogues and, uh, and research libraries and, 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 and uh, religious institutions around Europe and around the world, you will see paintings and sculptings and pictures of Moses and Jesus and the twelve apostles doing all kinds of wonderful things for people with a magic wand. Go on the web and type in Jesus, Moses, and magic wands. And you will see as far back as a thousand years ago, they have pictures and temples and churches and cathedrals. Uh, on the walls of the temples and churches of Jesus resurrecting people with a magic wand. He was changing water into wine with a magic wand. Moses was doing this and that with the people with a magic wand. 
So that's the name of that tune. Most people don't know that, but do some research. You'll see I'm right. All these stories about Moses and Jesus and the apostles doing all these wonderful things. Well, the church is telling you, and synagogues are telling you, it was all done with magic wands. But anyway, let's go back to this whole story of, uh, of Moses. Moses is not a Hebrew word or name at all. Moses is an Egyptian term. It means something. Uh, it's a secret symbol that means something. Uh, a classic example of what I tried to tell you on the past hour is that people are hearing stories about uh, religious figures that really do not understand what the real secret story really is. And so there's a exoteric uh, story and an esoteric story. Uh, exoteric is E-X. Exoteric means... The story you read in the Bible, just open up the Bible in Genesis and read it, and that's an exoteric story, meaning that's what everybody's going to see. Anybody open the Bible, just read it, and that's it. That's, you got it, and that's the story. But there's also something called an ES, an esoteric story, meaning a hidden story, an occult story. The word occult simply means hidden so then you talk to the people who really know what the name of the tune is, the, the rabbis who have studied these ancient writings and know where they really came from and what they actually are talking about. And that's an esoteric story. Well, that's the kind of story you don't need to know nothing about. You just read the Bible and, and believe whatever it is you're told and everything's fine. And then one day you wake up when you're 90 years old in an old folks home and you find out everything you have believed in your life was a lie. Purposely designed to trick you into believing something that was not true at all. And so um, that's what I've been looking at for 59 years. All the stuff that is an esoteric story. I talk with the rabbis, the researchers, and writers, and and inquire of the universities, and it's a really interesting story about how much you don't know. A classic example of what I'm talking about is we're told the story about Moses and the Ten Commandments. That story is so pregnant, like so many other stories about Moses, but the Ten Commandments story is so pregnant with extraordinary hidden symbols that really just will uh, knock you out when you begin to see what that story really came from and what it's actually talking about. It has nothing to do with anything you thought you understood about the Ten Commandments. First of all, there was no Ten Commandments at all, period. We now know, because if you go back and watch Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, we've talked about this before, but I'll set it up by saying this, that in the movie, Indiana Jones is commissioned by the U.S. government to go out and find the Jewish Lost Ark of the Covenant. It had to do with the Ten Commandments in that time in the Jewish history, so-called. Well, Indiana Jones is supposedly the one man that if anyone could find the lost Ark of the Covenant, uh, it would be him. So the government sends him out to get the lost Ark and finds out that the Germans and the Nazis are looking for the lost Ark also. Well, there's a reason why. You will see the connection between the Nazi movement and the Jewish religion. Wow, what a story there is there. The Jewish religion in relation to the Nazi German, uh, Nazism in Germany. There's a big story there. But I'm not going to get into that. Let's stick with what we were talking about. So, Moses goes up into the mountain, uh, to Mount Sinai. But first of all, the, uh, Mount Sinai is, is named after a moon god. In Arabia, thousands of years ago, there was a moon god. Today, his name is Allah. Today, we call Allah uh, as, a, as an Arabic name for God. And that God, Allah, was well known for a thousand years 
even before Islam developed, before uh, Muhammad ever lived, there was already the worship of Allah. And we know that Allah was a moon god. And so, uh, but so when Moses goes up, we find that he's going up into the mountain called Mount Sinai, which in point of fact, the uh, encyclopedias will tell you that the moon god that we today refer to as Allah is the same moon god that the Jews call Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. Yahweh is Allah, Allah is Arabic, Yahweh is Hebrew. It's the same God. And so therefore Moses was the leader or the, or the namesake. He wasn't a leader because Moses never lived. There was no such a man named Moses who ever lived. It's part of the story, the Arabic story from thousands of years ago, the Arabic story of the worship of the moon god. Well, and the let, moon me, god, let me break in here for, for a good reason. Yep. Uh, the moon god. So there's this god, there's that god, and what you're saying is that they are the same god, this particular moon god, which, again, if you look at the Islamic symbols today, you'll see there, there's a crescent moon. Okay. Yep. But here's the fascinating thing. Moses is credited generally in the mainstream sense as being one of the first people to talk about. I mean, obviously, Abraham allegedly was talking to uh, the one true God. But let's put Abraham aside because he's a whole other subject. Moses is allegedly going up to the mountain to speak to the one true God. Mm -hmm. Now, this monotheism that is being represented here sounds, again, an awful lot like, and I mentioned this in the first hour, sounds an awful lot like what the Pharaoh Akhenaten did, (laughs) where it came down to, there's only one God, forget all these other gods. And there were many gods at this particular point in history, and throughout history, there were many gods that were uh, worshipped, represented, that that allegedly visited, that had stories about them. All of them seem to converge, but see, it's interesting here that the one true God gives his laws to Moses according to the story and what does he do it with with a burning bush <laughs> and on this yeah. mountain so you're tell, you you told us about the mountain and how Sinai is you know it, it, that's interesting but the idea that this is the one god as opposed to just this particular moon god which anybody who knew about the moon god would say that he wasn't the only god right uh, yeah. But the, he was a god. Now this right, is. Look at, we're told that the Jews were the original monotheistic religion. They right. were the original people who had the idea of only one true God. Well, in point of fact, that is just a story that has no legitimacy and no factual history to that at all. History, if you go to any good library. Uh, and look up the history of the Jewish people, you will see that the Jewish people were uh, anything but monotheistic. They were worshippers of many gods. They have, And today, Judaism is a combination of at least seven different ancient uh, religious institutions of the ancient world that have been molded into one religion. Today is called Judaism, but Judaism is actually seven different ancient religions that have been amalgamated into one. And so today, uh, part of the one seventh of the Jewish religion is the worship of the planet uh, uh, Saturn. Saturn is a very important god now to the Jews of today. Uh, the moon god, the moon god. Uh, is very important to the the Jewish religion today. Even the Jews admit that they have a lunar calendar, not a solar, but a lunar calendar. And why do they have their holy days after sunset? Always after sundown, their day begins at 6 o'clock in the evening to 6 o'clock the next evening. That is a fact. Why why do the Jews have a 6 o'clock... in the evening starts their day. That's when the moon comes out at six o'clock. So they are a moon worshiping cult. 
And right. therefore, the ancient, if you go back to encyclopedias and look up the word S-I-N, sin, it's not the falling short like the Catholic Church says, is that when you fall short and you've done something wrong, it's a sin. No, look up the word sin, S-I-N. It will tell you in a dictionary, sin was the name of the moon god of Arabia. Today, we refer to him today as Allah. But no, originally Allah's name was S-I-N, the moon god. And the ancient world, and the ancient uh, uh, Arabic world, from Egypt and from the West Sinai, you look eastward every evening at 6 o'clock, and there's a huge and high mountain range in Sinai. And so from Egypt's side and from the western Sinai, looking back east, every evening at 6 o'clock, the moon came out of the mountain. So they were looking for the moon god, and every evening he popped out of the mountain. So the Arabs called the moon god Sin, S-I-N, and he became known as the old man of the mountain. We've heard that term in religion, the old man of the mountain. And so Sin was obviously a moon god. S-I-N was his name, and A-I was a mountain in the ancient Arabic. And so A-I is a mountain, and the god of that mountain is called Sin. So you put it together, it becomes Sinai. No, Sin A-I, the mountain of the moon god, Sin. Right now, Get because it? because you uh, uh, talked about Saturn also being a uh, part of the well, yeah, but I got five more. You know, we could go back to five more different gods, but I'm just making the point about Mount Sinai. Right. It's so holy. It's not holy. It's a ho- it's a mountain in which the people of, of Egypt and the Western Sinai would look eastward at six o'clock in the evening, and they would see the moon rise from the mountain. So the ancient uh, Arabic world believed that the moon was a god. And so, but he obviously, uh, it doesn't take a genius to realize, the moon lived in the mountain. Why? Because it's where he comes up from. Every, every evening at 6 o'clock, you see him waking up to start a new day. So the new day begins at 6 in the evening, and that's the way it works today, that the Jews count their days from 6 in the evening to 6 in the evening. Why? Because that's when the moon god Sin rose from the mountain. So he starts his day at 6 in the evening. So did the Jews. They have a lunar calendar based on the moon. So once you understand that lunar worship, Moses was nearly a word that is used in relation to the lunar religion of the ancient Arabic world. There, in point of actual fact, was no Moses. Moses never lived. But it's like telling the story about Jesus and telling the story about Buddha or telling the story about some other religious figure that actually, in fact, never existed. So you have to have a focal point for that religion well the focal point was Moses then you understand Moses was not an actual uh, person who really lived but Moses was a name of a of a a leader of the lunar cult and so he went up into uh, the mountain of Mount Sinai and the scripture says and all the reference works say will tell you that Mount Sinai where Moses went up was was on fire. It was a frightening experience for the Israelites. They were told to not go near that mountain. It was very very frightening for the for the story goes, because it was it was uh, it was exploding. There was fire and, and and smoke coming from the mountain. And the Bible says in the book of Job and in the Old Testament it talks about when Moses went up into the mountain to see Jehovah and Yahweh. Uh, it was a very frightening experience because the mountain was on fire with smoke and and, and lightning going. And so, well, all, all you have to do is, is have enough brains to understand a mountain that's on fire and bellowing smoke and fire is a volcano. He went up into a volcano. And so then you find out, well, wait a minute. 
the, the Midianites and the ancient Midianites, of which Moses was supposedly one, or a married one, was a Midianite, and the Midianites worshipped a goddess, a goddess who was a volcano. And today we still have volcanoes around the world with women's names. And Hawaii is a, a very big volcano. It's got a woman's name. Why? Because volcanoes were understood to be symbolically a woman doing sex. It's a hole that's burning with fire. And so she is blowing apart uh, in sexual, uh, you know, sexual uh, ecstasy. It's a volcano. And so the whole system of, of religion based on sex in the volcano Look in the look in the dictionary on the volcano worship, and it will tell you all the the many different volcanoes which symbolize sex of a female. And so now you go back to the story of Moses going up into the volcano, which is a symbol for female sexual release, and then uh, he talks with uh, uh, he talks with God. And when he comes down from Mount Sinai, Sin Ai, Sin Ai, the mountain of the god Sin, uh, he has ten commandments. Well, I point to the fact there was no ten commandments, period. Uh, and this is why I told you that Indiana Jones goes to uh, find the lost Ark of the Covenant. Where does he go first? Well, Indiana Jones is a lot of things, but stupid is not one of them. So where does he go to find the, the the holy Ark of the Covenant, the Jewish Ark of the Covenant? He goes to Tibet and to northern India and to Tibet first, because that's where you need to go. Spielberg knew that, so he put that in the movie. And so from Tibet, <coughs> excuse me, from Tibet, Spielberg has Indiana Jones going to what the Holy Land. Uh, Israel, God's chosen people and, and God, God's chosen land and the Holy Land? No. Indiana Jones goes to Egypt and he finds the lost ark in Egypt in a tomb in Egypt. Spielberg is a lot of things, but stupid isn't one of them. And he knows exactly what that story really came from. And that's why I like watching Spielberg's movies, because I know what he's doing. He's telling you something, but you're being entertained and you don't see it. So Indiana Jones finds the, the lost Ark of the Covenant in Egypt. Why? Because it never was a Jewish Ark to start with. All the encyclopedias, the Britannica, Americana, the Jewish Encyclopedia... The Catholic Encyclopedia, just do some research on the lost Ark of the Covenant, and it will tell you there was no Ark of the Covenant. It never existed. It's a story that came out of the ancient Arabic world that had to do with Egypt. <clears throat> and it was an Egyptian Ark. And if you go on my website, the jordanmaxwellshow.com, and join my research society. It takes something to do it. Join my research society. One of the first things you will see is all the history of religions, all the symbols and words of religion that you never knew, you've never been told. <clears throat> and it's right there that you will see what I'm talking about. Almost all the things I will talk about in this program are already on my research society. So, you want the pictures? Go join the research society on my website, Jordan Maxwell Show. Now, when you see that uh, Indiana Jones finds a lost Ark of the Covenant in Egypt, <clears throat> it's because there was no lost Ark of the Hebrews, period. It's just a story. The Bible is referred to as the greatest story ever told. It's not the greatest collection of historical facts ever assembled the greatest story ever told. I used to get in trouble as a little kid. My mom would say, are you telling us a story? Meaning, are you fabricating a lie? It's just a story. Well, that's what the Bible is called, the greatest story ever told. Why? It's because the stories in the Bible have been told hundreds of times before. And, they are, and, and so it's just a retelling 
now in the so-called Hebrew tradition, a retelling of stories that were around 5,000 years before the Jewish people ever existed. And they just today are taking from Hollywood, and we know what's going on in Hollywood. And they take stories from the old ancient Sumerians, Babylonians, Akkadians, the Hittites, uh, especially the Canaanite peoples of the ancient, uh, ancient East, and they rework them into stories and call it Hebrew. And point of fact, there was no Moses, there was no Ten Commandments, there was no Jewish Ark of the Covenant. There was an Egyptian Ark of the Contract. Egyptian Ark of the Contract, not Jewish Ark of the Covenant. So there was no Jewish Ark of the Covenant. So that's why you don't have to go worry, worry about going out and researching and trying to find the lost Ark of the Covenant. And we know it's out there somewhere in the Middle East. It's being hidden in the Middle East. No, it's not being hidden in the Middle East. It never existed to start with. It's just a story that has no basis in actual fact at all. And then if you look at the Bible, Old Testament, is where you find out about the Ark of the Covenant, we'll go to the New Testament and go to the book of Revelation. The last book in the New Testament and in the book of Revelation, it says God took the, the Ark of the Covenant uh, and took it into a heaven. And so in heaven, there is now an Ark of the Covenant, the Bible says, in heaven. So when you get these poor people, ill-informed, unread, uh, ignorant, ill-informed people who believe that there is a, a divine Ark of the Covenant and they're still looking for it today. And we're told that all the Ethiopians have it. It's all that's where it is. The Ark of the Covenant is in Ethiopia. And, and, but, well, can we go see it? No, 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 you can't see it. Because the Ethiopians say it's so holy that we can't show it to you. Oh, really? That's like the scientists and astronomers today telling me that there's a black hole out there. I ask, have you ever brought back a piece of a black hole for me to see? No, no. You can't see it because it's black and it's a hole. Oh, okay. So therefore, I believe that there's a black hole out there. Why? Because you told me. and But you can't show it to me because it's black and it's a hole. Yeah, well, how convenient. No, I begin to see that this is all a story, the whole thing. Now, when Moses uh, goes up into the mountain, the mountain is on fire. It's a volcano, obviously, because the scripture said that God was with Moses and the, in the, in the Hebrew and the ancient Israelite people. And how did they know that? Because it said the, the mountain was on fire at night in a pillar of cloud by day. Well, that's what a volcano is. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but volcanoes are a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of, of cloud by night. All you have to do is look at a recent video from Hawaii, and you can see exactly what happens uh, when a volcano just (laughs) begins to uh, stir. And yes, indeed, uh, the glowing red hot stuff is there, but then uh, the the soot, the smoke, all of it, the debris in the air itself uh, literally creates a dark cloud around the uh, the actual place. I mean, this is just the physical reality. It's a perfect description for a That's volcano. Exactly right. right. But go read the Bible, and when it says that Moses went up to the mountain, it was on fire, and all the Israelites and all the poor people uh, watching Moses go up on the mountain. It says that frightened them. They were frightened to death, and they they wanted to get away from there because it was a it was a violent. Uh, eruption on the mountain and they said God is there he's really angry and he's uh, he's erupting and he's really mad and he's really angry and Moses you have to go up and, and quiet him down and, and make some kind of a peaceful you know, arrangement with him because he's just burning mad and in the, and in daytime uh, he's a he's a cloud by day and a fire by night so we now know that Mount Sinai we're talking about volcano worship which which uh, which is actually goes back to the ancient old Phoenician Canaanites and the Hittites who had the volcano as a goddess symbol for the goddess because she's erupting and, and, and violent and that's where we got something called the uh, well the Ten Commandments now the Ten Commandments were actually based on the twelve 
negative confessions. Go to a library and read a book about the 12 negative confessions. Because there were 12 uh, laws of negative confessions that the Egyptians had. And they called it the 12 negative confessions because the Ten Commandments said, Thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. But the negative confessions of the Egyptians said, I will not do. I will not do this. I will not have strange gods before me. I will not covet my neighbor's wife and his goods. I will not lie against my brother. I will not do this. I will not do that. But the but the Ten Commandments said, Thou shalt not do this. And so that's where you get the Ten Commandments. It's from the Egyptian Twelve Negative Confessions. Go do some research and you'll find there was no Ten Commandments. That's why Indiana Jones finds a lost ark in Egypt. It's an Egyptian story from start to finish. But Moses then goes up into the mountain and he comes back with these Ten Commandments. Now in the movie, uh, you remember that that um, that Charlton Heston comes down from the mountain. And he's got these two big slab stones, and on it is is written by the hand of God is written the the Ten Commandments on these stone tablets. Well, actually, there wasn't no stone tablets at all. It's just a story. If you go back to the encyclopedias on religion and ethics, encyclopedias of religious symbols, etc., you will find that the Jews today call the Ten Commandments, not the stones, of, uh, you know, they are, they are talking about uh, rock and stone. The Ten Commandments are referred to today as the stones of the testimony. The stones of the testimony. And there had to be two stones of the testimony, one in each hand. But no, the actual reference book will tell you that the stones of the testimony were two round, small stones that you could carry in one hand. And so these two round stones had the Ten Commandments written on one all the way around the circle, or the Ten Commandments written on the one stone, and according to uh, the, 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 the religious uh, philosophers and teachers, they say that the second uh, round stone was identical to the first. So there were two witnesses. God had two stones saying the same thing. So he had two witnesses, because in Hebrew and Jewish religion, two witnesses are important. And so you have two witnesses, are, which is actually small round stones that can be carried in one hand. And they were called the stones of the testimony. This is why when you are in school, you're going to take a test. Or you're going to a court, you're going to testify. A testimonial. Testify comes from testes. That's where it comes from. Look in the encyclopedia. Dictionary will tell you testes, the two round stones. They are called the, the stones of the testimony, the testicle. And that's why in the ancient Egyptian and even in the Hebrew, uh, I don't know if it's practiced today, but in the ancient world we're told that if one Jew brings another Jew into the Jewish court, you are bringing your brother Jew into court and you are now at war with him. Because there's going to be a trial. Somebody's going to jail and somebody's going to pay. And so in order for you as a Jew going before the Jewish high court uh, to, to testify against your brother, you were required to hold your testicles in your hand as you make your speech and as you testify. Why? Because the symbol is obvious. If we catch you lying, against your brother in this court, you know what's going to happen to you because you're holding your testicles. And so today we even have uh, people saying the same thing. When you go into court, they got you. They got you by the balls. Yeah, the two round stones of the testimony. So there wasn't big plates of, 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 of rock. It was just two round small stones carried at one hand and they were called stones of the testament. Well, interesting so to know, too, that when you sign your marriage contract, uh, which is a contract also, as some people refer to it as the covenant of marriage, but right. uh, in reality, you, you require two witnesses, don't you? That's right. 
Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to show that parallel. Go ahead. Yeah, and you do have two witnesses. Yeah, hanging between your legs, the two witnesses, the test stuff. That too. <laughs> but, That's anyway. right. Please continue. So, therefore, that's the name of the tomb for the Ten Commandments. There was no Ten Commandments. There were twelve negative confessions. But the Ten Commandments were not big stones. It was just two round, small stones. And they were called the the stones of the testa. And testa comes from testes. So, you know, take that and two bucks and get you a cup of coffee. But that's what I'm talking about. There's so much you didn't know about the stories of Moses. Now... Moses goes up into uh, and up into the mountain that's on fire, and he uh, he confronts the Almighty God, and something called the uh, the uh, burning bush. Well, if you rem- if, if today watch on television, and when there's news stories on TV at news at night, you will see the Jews in Jerusalem in Jerusalem, and they are praying at the wailing wall. They're praying at the wall. Uh, and so, but watch the Jews as they're praying at the wall. They're bobbing back and forth, up and down, bob, back and forth. They're bobbing. Have you ever seen that? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Do you know what that symbolizes? It symbolizes they're having sex with God. They're bobbing back and forth, having sex. It's a sexual symbol. And they're having sex with something called the Shekinah, not he kinda, she kinda. And so the she kinda is the female part of God, because the scripture says in Genesis that God created man, um, man and woman, male and female, he created them. So logic alone would tell you that God must be male and female. He's a homophonite God. He's both male and female. So then he divides himself as he does with all animals, all animals. There's a male side and the female side. And so now that's why the Jews are bobbing back and forth because they're having sex with the she kind of. Because that's what it's spelled, S-H-E, she kind of, is the feminine part of God, uh, feminine sex with God. So therefore, today we got Jews out there uh, bobbing back and forth, having sex with God. And uh, and so the burning bush, uh, when you go back to the encyclopedias, I'll look up the word burning bush and begin to see where the burning bush was simply a term that came out of the ancient Arabic world for the female uh, during sex. So it's a sexual symbol for the female, the burning bush. And so when you start to look at these words and terms and find out what they're really talking about, it doesn't have anything to do with the holiness of holies that you know about. It's talking about sex, alcohol, drugs, power, money. The whole thing is an incredible uh, story. Another wonderful story about Moses when he's up on the mountain, the volcano, which symbolizes a female in sex. But he's up on that, uh, uh, on the, on the mountain, and it says Moses asked God if he could see him. He wanted to actually see God. And the scripture says that God said, no, Moses, uh, you know, I appreciate everything you've done. You're, You're a faithful follower, but, uh, no man can see me and live. So if I show you what I look like, I'll have to kill you. So no man can see me and live. And then it says, but then God said, he added something, an addendum to that. God says, well, first of all, you've been so holy and righteous, Moses, and you've been so faithful that I think I'll make a, a special case for you. Normally, No man can see me and live. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. Only because you are so holy and righteous. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do something for you. And it's going to be wonderful. I'm going to show you, the scripture says, I'm going to show you my glory. The most glorious part of my presence in this universe. I'm going to show it to you. And, uh, and so he said, so Moses, Uh, is now excited. God has allowed him to see God's glory. 
So God says to Moses, now you see that big rock over there, those big rocks over there? Yeah. Go over behind those rocks and hide yourself. This is what the scripture says. Go over, God says to Moses, go over there and hide yourself. And I'm going to pull my pants down and my drawers down and I'm going to show you my ass. And so when I give you the high side, you peep out and you can see my butt. And that will be wonderful. That's my glory to see my ass. And so, and then you can go back and tell all the Israelites that you saw God pulling his pants down and you saw his butt. And that's his glory. And so that's what the scripture says. Moses popped out from behind the, the rocks when God called him and he could see God's butt. And so I don't know what that tells you. No, I would add to that. Yeah, that and two bucks will get you a cup of coffee. You know, I was going to so, say, I, I, I'm not sure what to take from that. <laughs> um, you know, uh, what, what, what is it that you take from that? I'm, I'm, I'm unsure except that it seems to be strange behavior for yeah, but it's in the Vatican. Have you seen the Sistine Chapel where God is reaching out to touch Adam? Or well, just yeah. above that is a picture of God bending over, showing his butt. That's you, in the Sistine Chapel. You know, I've never noticed it, but I, I bet you I can find a, uh, an image of well, that. I bet you could. Just go just go and God and uh, touching Adam. And you know the man reclining and he's reaching out to touch God. And God is reaching out to touch him, and their two fingers are almost touching. We're just above that. Just go on the web and type in God showing his ass. God oh. showing his butt, and you will see a beautiful painting on the Sistine Chapel ceiling of God bending over and Moses looking at his butt. I didn't paint it. I'm just telling you, it's there. No, I, I, I believe you, Jordan. And believe it or not, we, we've almost come to the end of the second hour. Uh, but it's, it's just objectively, I'm sitting here and saying to myself, <laughs> right? No, well, look at Moses was, was up there seeing the moon god, uh, you know, Yahweh, the moon god. But the moon god is showing his ass. He's showing uh, Moses his butt. Okay, and that's on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So today, we have young kids today who will drive by and they pull their pants down, stick their butt out the window, and they call it mooning you. Mooning you. Why? Because the moon god, Yahweh, mooned Moses. He's the moon god. He bent over and showed his glory, which was his big ass, and he showed his, the moon to Moses because he's the moon god, mooning Moses. And that's what we call it today. Kids will pull their pants down and drive by and stick their butt out the window and it's called mooning you. Let's see, and there's even phrases, uh, popular phrases in a couple of different languages that basically translate in English to, uh, to showing your ass. Of uh, course, absolutely. And, and literally, the, I, I never, never considered this. Um, but, just like take a step back for a second though Jordan and just you know let's kind of finish on this note tonight because this to me is is a bizarre piece of the story uh if i were to take this entire narrative seriously right and you're climbing up on a allegedly sacred mountain of course you covered that but let's just let's just go with the face value for a second you're a leader of a people you've climbed up a sacred mountain and uh you are you are going there to commune with your god who is the one god according to the fable yeah um and what he does is show you his ass um <laughs> he shows you his butt i i'm just i i'm i'm dumbfounded by yeah, that so you can go idea. home now and tell all the jewish people the followers that you saw god showing his ass up there he was, yep god's out there showing his ass again I mean, that's just, I mean, it sounds comical, but it's actually what's there, isn't it? Of course. Read it. And go read it. And he was healing, and Moses was healing people with this, with this uh, magic wand. And the moon god Sin lived in the mountain. Every night came up, woke up at 6 o'clock, so therefore the Jews still have their holidays after 6 o'clock. They have the days after 6 o'clock. This is why we have the Ten Commandments. No, two small round stones called the stones of the testimony. Two testicles. 
It's a wonderful, wonderful, incredible, dark secret of the Jewish religion that nobody seems to know anything about. But it's all there. If you just go to encyclopedia and look it up, it's all there. Well, the other and, the other interesting part of this is throughout most of these discussions, and again, we are getting close to the end here, but throughout most of these discussions, you know what, what one of the biggest overall themes is here in the three major religions uh, is sex. Sex yeah. and, uh, you know... Well, the bottom line on the earth is sex. That is the bottom line on the earth for mankind, is sex, period. It's the most powerful single uh, directive on the human planet. The earth is sex. You don't think so? Look around. The Arabs and the Ara- Arabic religion of Islam... Right. Uh, adults can marry a child, six years old girl. They can marry a five year old. And if you, and, and, and they can, uh, um, they can take the five year old home as a wife, a four, five, six year old child. And, and of course in the, in the Jewish Talmud, all you gotta do is go to a library, get the Talmud, the Babylonian, the, or the, the Babylonian Talmud and read the Jewish Babylonian Talmud. It talks about how it's perfectly all right for a grown man to have sex and sleep with a six-year-old boy or, or a five-year-old girl. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It's all part of the ancient tradition of adults having sex with children. And that's in the Talmud. It's all there. All you got to do is just go on the web and type in sex with children in the Babylonian Talmud. It gives you all the scriptures in the Talmud where the ancient rabbi has said there's nothing to it. You marry a little six-year-old and take her uh, back as a wife, and uh, and if she dies from the rape, well, that's too bad. But there's another six-year-old out there you can. So we know that the Jews were were into uh, child uh, sex and child stuff. We we know all of that. We, today we call it pornography. No, it's just child sex. Right, and then and, the and Catholics. We know, we know that Islam uh, that uh, that that um, yeah. the Islamic religion. Has uh, you know child marriages where and and the one thing about the the Islamic religion Muhammad uh, that religion says that you, you cannot have sex with a child unless you're married you have to be properly married well that's that's nice so how do you do that well there is in Islam today there is a there is a law that says that you can rent a, a, a little kid uh, for the night, and so it's a, it's a one twenty four hour twenty four hour marriage. There's a word for it in, in the Islamic world. I forgot the word, but it's a word for it, which means if you're an Islamic follower today, you can if you see some little kid that you like, so you can go to the parent and say, "I want to marry her, but just for tonight, just for tonight." So the parents will give you a price, whatever the price is. And then there will be a small, quickie little ceremony, <laughs> like we do in Vegas, a little quickie ceremony where you are married for 24 hours. You bring her back 24 hours from now, but you can live with her tonight like you're married. And she's only eight years old. She's only seven years old. doesn't matter. And so you can rent her for the night. It's called a marriage, but you have to pay for it. Mm. And just and so, just to be fair to the three major religions, though, we also had to cover where the nuns come from, right. and they're not always uh, as as somebody stated, you know, the twelve year old, uh, uh, you know, age of consent there in the Vatican. Um, right. I'm very sure that there were much younger nuns at various points. I mean, today we're we're faced with the scandals, you know, the alleged scandals that come from the Catholic Church and uh, mm-hmm. the uh, the abuse of boys. But then again, in a lot of cases, they're altar boys and they're men to be on the altar anyway That's so right. uh you know but but my point is you know e- even outside of e- if you remove all of this uh horrendous i mean let's just call it what it is a, a pedophilia if yeah. you remove all that it's still all about sex even even when you get rid of these you know uh, horrible the things part of it but it's still the basic fundamental principles of mankind men and women Mm. Sex, boys and girls. Well, see now, old you, men, young girls, right? Older women, young boys. It's still the bottom line is only God can create life. 
Well, that's what the man does, creates life. Mm. And that is and that is the interesting part. But, of course, we've come to the end of this particular episode. This is the third one. But uh, if you want to explore this topic further, first of all, I suggest you go back and listen to the other two. Uh, and the rest of this series, as it unfolds, we'll be doing this live every Monday until Jordan says we have... Uh, completed what we needed to but I've got to tell you guys that uh, this has been an incredible uh, set of discussions uh, you can always go ahead and study some more on your own by going to jordanmaxwellshow.com and uh, go ahead into the research society link there there is a great deal of information which is not just out on the website. I mean, there's lots of nice stuff on the website, uh, various links and, uh, different, uh, ways in which you can, uh, support Jordan directly. Remember, jordanmaxwellshow.com is the only website that actually has Jordan Maxwell. So, uh, <laughs> you yes, gotta... And also, yeah. uh, if you wanted to make a donation, I live on donations. And so how I survive is on donations, period. Because I only get seven hundred dollars a month in Social Security, and I practically have no place to live and no money to live on. I've been doing this all my life, and I've paid a price for it. So now I've lost everything. So if you would like what what I'm doing, then help me stay alive by by sending a donation. And there's so many things I would love to do and tell you, and and make available, but I I can't do it. I don't have anything. I don't have anything. So if you want to make a donation, that would be appreciated. Well, and that's join my join my research society because it's enormous, and I got that much more coming. Right, and and one last final thing for me is that you know what I bet that uh, if somebody really wanted to uh, to hire you too, I mean, and and really uh, 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 kind I would of love that. you know, yeah, if somebody had the funds to really do something with this, where I could where I could have the money to produce some sensational, incredible stuff on the world stage. And I've been doing it for 60 years, 59 years. I've got stuff that you have never heard. And well, I would love to, before I leave this world, I'll be doing that soon at, at 78 years old. Well, that that, that, that was the point I wanted to make, it. is that, quite honestly, uh, no, no offense to you, Jordan, but, I mean, there, there's only a little bit of time left where people are going to be able to have access to Jordan Maxwell. And uh and and quite honestly, uh if you wanted Jordan in a documentary, if you wanted to make a film with him, uh he's open to all these possibilities. You can contact him through the website. And yep. uh you know, and and that's something that I I think, you know, some people might not be considering, but uh but but please do, you know, don't. Well, I, I would like to produce, I'd like to produce some earth-shaking stuff. I mean, I've got some really powerful, I mean, if you think what you've heard tonight was off the wall, wait till you hear the rest of the story. And so I would love to be able to tell the world what I really know, but I can't do that. I have no funds to do anything. I live in one room by myself, mm-hmm. totally one room by myself. And, and live on Social Security of $750 a month. That's how I live from one month to the next. And after rent and all the other stuff, I, I don't have beans to. And so what money comes in to my website because of the research goes to my, uh, goes to the website, goes to the webmaster. It costs money to do what he's doing and keeping me out there on the web. So I don't see much of that at all. So. If you want to help right. me, just make a, a, a donation because at this point I don't have anything. But I, I will, I will guarantee you when I die, I'm going to take with me knowledge you have never heard before. Period. Right. If and got any ideas about doing something? I'd like to hear it. That's the thing. Like I said, you'd be open to all those things. I didn't even ask Jordan about that, but I know. Uh, the situation, and I know that uh, I, I wish I had the funds to fund Jordan Maxwell myself. Uh, but if you are interested, absolutely contact him. Anyway, uh, we will continue this series next week. We've gone a little over time, but I'll figure out a way to cut this down so that we don't uh, take away any of the important information in tonight's discussion. Uh, Jordan, I want to thank you again for joining me, and uh, we will continue the discussion next week. We, we've got a bit more ground to cover on Moses, I think, but we we could also yeah. discuss some other figures, uh, you know, and, and I'd oh, no, like... No, no, we will. We will. The 
us a lot of stuff, but just remember, go on the web and check out Jesus and, and Moses and Magic Wands. Jesus, and, uh, Moses, and Magic Wands. Yeah, do, right. do that in your search. I'm going to attach some other links. <laughs>